we would like to now start our next session which is capacity building towards exports and create competitiveness the next session i would like to uh, call upon our chairperson dr bos nayar president wtc world trade center samshinabad and vishakhapatnam welcome sir we would like to call upon mr sivan siloi the ceo and founder siloi trading company limited mauritius we would like to call upon our esteemed speaker mr hamanta k boraha the managing director of pan iim consulting organization now i would like to call upon our two other international foreign delegates dr masina professor university of zimbabwe textiles department and our another colleague he is from mauritius to join us for this panel discussion and share his views on exports and on trade that's my surprise and dr reddy he would be moderating the session i would like to call upon you sir thank you sir thank you. i will have a chair for you sir so good afternoon uh, after a very uh, brilliant session we had a panel discussion uh, now we we are going to have one more very important panel discussion and which is very much relevant uh, related to capacity building towards export and trade competitiveness like one of the very important vision india has got very important vision india has got is to reach 5 trillion economy 5 trillion economy by 2025 second very important thing is vocal for local and another very important thing is to reach the export competitiveness unfortunately most of our entrepreneurs who are into textiles especially maybe eco handlooms eco textiles apparels and so on they are of world class but because of lack lack of knowledge or lack of training in export documentation they are unable to promote their products in international market one of the reasons could be the export documentation procedures the documentation procedures are not that easy so i we would like to have a discussion we have a panel we have uh, mr shivan here who is from marshes and uh, of course uh, we also have michael we have dr bos nair whose most of his uh, life he has spent with wtc worked with wtc mumbai world trade center mumbai for a very long stint then wtc bengaluru then now presently is the president of wtc samshabad and uh, visakhapatnam uh, the apn telangana state and of course uh, we also have hamanta kumar barua managing partner and we have 
Dr. Masina, who is our goodwill ambassador from Zimbabwe, all the way over, uh, she has come here. Of course, uh, I feel she is little sleepy because of she has sleepless nights over a period of time. I can understand this. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to know from the panelists what exactly is capacity building and how it is being initiated in terms of understanding the difficult, complicated trade procedures which change from country to country, that, that especially the documentation procedures, the customs, and so on, and how this ease of doing the ease of doing export business we always talk about ease of doing business but ease of doing export business would definitely help in promoting the international business so i start with my uh, dear friend uh, mr shivan how it is happening in his own country thank you so much dr reddy first allow me to uh, uh, express my congratulations for the organization of the event, which is a very brilliant idea to organize, to organize such an event. Briefly also, I wish to introduce you rapidly Mauritius. Mauritius is now very known as a platform for doing business in a number of sectors and Presently, Mauritius is positioned itself as a hub in between Asia and Africa as much as what Singapore has done in between Asia for, for the Asian region. So this is briefly, rapidly on Mauritius. Capacity building is my profession. I've been exercising in this profession for over 20 years, and it is also my passion. So sharing this topic with you in this time where uh, business need to be reinvented, it's very important. India is known for people here are in many cases self-made men. Million and million of people has been self-made men, which has contributed largely in all of the sectors of the economy. But now it is important to move to the next step. And the next step is how to bring capacity building to all these people who are contributing to the economy so as to position more and more in competitiveness in this competitive world. When we are talking about capacity building, it's not just about people. It's the full ecosystem, the full landmark of business. Because capacity building is people, is technology, is everything that will contribute to build up the uh, business. But I will put emphasis on people. Let me, for example, take, let me take an example. Nothing can happen without people. You can have the very extraordinary technology. You can have the 5G. You can have the best connectivity. For example, I will be very basic. You put this chair here. It can be one of the best chair you can have. If nobody displays him, nobody use him, nobody use it, nobody displays it, it will be waste. It will be rubbish. So behind whatever we do, there is people. And when people has, when we build up capacity of people, we build what we call people richness. This is a modern term coming in called people richness. 
when we arrive to build people richness, we will bring what we call and what your prime minister here in India is willing to reach and going ahead, what we call the high income economies. So high income economies through micro business, through small enterprise, through initiative will come and this will bring to us to the high income economies where the standard of living, where the, uh, the, the lifestyle will change. So from self-made man, right, it is very important to build this capacity building. Because as I mentioned to you, how to build capacity building, that is one question. Capacity building is not necessarily academic. It's not necessarily training. It's all about the partnership with people. Be it in your firm, small firm, be it wherever you are. If people want now to be valued, people want not just only to be an employee or someone here, people want to be partner in the enterprise. People want to be partner in the micro. People want to be partner in the medium, small economic sector. People don't just want to be an employee. This is the path. This is the path. We are now moving to where we mentioned about people richness. I will just again elaborate something, right? When people in an enterprise is recognized as a partner, they feel what they call a, a sense of belonging. More and more, I will not, I will not uh, learn you anything uh, new. More and more, loyalty is put in a shake. Uh, people, there is no more loyalty. People in a company may be working for you for five years, 10 years, whatever, but for whatever reason, they may leave you and join the competitors. They may leave you and join anywhere else. So loyalty is disappearing in whatever sector, in whatever uh, topic in life. But when you try to build this partnership within your organization, in your business, this is where capacity building is. Capacity building is recognize and respect the, your, your people inside of your organization. So this is what I want to share with you in a very bottom line, in a very grassroots level, not in an academic level, right? What about capacity building? I'm very glad that this topic is on this subject because we are talking about moving to another dimension about eco textile, about eco fashion, about the eco business, right? And I'm very glad that this topic is on this subject, is on this event because you're right. We will differentiate. India will differentiate itself right, in this approach. Because we cannot differentiate ourselves with other competitors other than through our people. Because technology can be copied. Anyone today can get the technology available in the world. A number of things can be copied, but people cannot be copied yet. The so minor people the partnership with people cannot be copied. And I will, I will probably advise, or advise anyone going in the sector, may it be in micro, in small business, to go in this direction. So this is my part contribution and I will continue. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. Uh, thank you, Sivan. Uh, it was wonderful, like, uh, like, Normally, when we talk about capacity building, we, as a training institute, 
uh, we talk about uh, the capacity building of the human beings, the human resources. But in addition to that, you have also given an overall view of the capacity building, uh, especially in towards the export uh, competitiveness and trade competitiveness, how this is going to happen. I'll come back to you. But I would like to disturb your uh, colleague from uh, Mauritius. Uh, how exactly uh, Mauritius, uh, uh, Mauritius as a country, when it is going for export competitiveness, what kind of initiatives that are being taken up by its government uh, towards uh, the trade competitiveness, especially export competitiveness? Yes, thank you. I, I will bring now the case to Mauritius, the Mauritius case. Mauritius moved very quickly from an agro-industry company, uh, country, right? When Mauritius gained independence in 1960, the country was absolutely in a poverty stage, and we were only in the agro-industry. Through some years, now we are very respected in the financial sector, in the ICT sector, in the tourism, particularly in the tourism sector. What happened is when at a point of time, we found that textile was not really bringing enough for the country, there was what we call the capacity building, which started in the country. Oh, because in Mauritius, unfortunately, no resources exist. We don't have mineral, we don't have natural resources. We don't have any resources except people, except human beings. Those has been understood by our leader and all emphasis was put on people. So moving from an agricultural in a very quick period, in a very, going to now as a respected financial hub, going now as an ICT hub, and most importantly, as a tourist destination. A number, every, sorry, a number of Indians want to visit Mauritius, of course, right? Because Mauritius has been able to trademark itself in the hospitality industry with what we call the service, the people service, the, the, the genuineness of the service. And as you know, in the service sector, like tourism, like finance, or whatever, the services is run by people. So moving from, my case is study on Mauritius is moving from an agro-industry, right, with absolutely no logic, and Mauritius with absolutely no resources, no natural resources, we are now a country who has achieved high income economy, which is recognized by the World Bank and by the IMF and a number of institutions. So this is the case of Mauritius. And I'm sure that could be, and we are ready, we have very, very, very good relationship with India. India has a special place in Mauritius, in the heart of Mauritius. Your prime minister, a number of you know, have visited India this relationship, and we think that we have a number of opportunities that we can share and contribute together, maybe the my sector, etc. Thank you. That's nice. That's like how the service sector has emerged vibrant and which has actually helped your economy in, bec in becoming a very stronger one. Uh, very nice. Now we have one gentleman uh, 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 from uh, World Trade uh, Center, uh, Dr. Boz Nair, uh, uh, very resourceful person. We had a very small stint of uh, uh, relation from last few months, but I could see is a bundle of uh, knowledge. And uh, especially uh, is part of World Trade Center as a vice chairperson and uh, is also the president of WTC Shamshabad and Vishakapatnam. Sir, uh, I would like to uh, ask you how exactly, how you place India 
in terms of trade competitiveness, especially the international trade competitiveness when compared to other countries and how best we are doing uh, because you are part of a uh, multinational organization, an international organization, but have seen different economies worldwide and uh, how it, India is positioned in this regard uh, and uh, what exactly has to be done and what best things we have when compared to other countries. Good. Now, if you really look into India's the policies procedures part of it, the easy of doing business, if you really look into India's really, if you compare what we were earlier and now what we are, there's a vast difference. Maybe prior to this liberalization part of it, it was too complicated, the policies, procedures, etc. Now, if you look into the foreign trade policy, if you look into the monetary policy, if you look into the, what you call Reserve Bank of India notifications or the customs notification, etc. It's a layman can understand that means it is there is not that complicated a legal express what you need it. I can know that means it's a business friendly. Now there are two areas I can know, what I always look into. I can know here what the trade or the exporters are facing is uh, one the transaction cost what we are paying is compared to any other nation we are paying too high. Maybe because of the infrastructure, like a lack of good infrastructure facilities. Second, the credit, what we are getting at, I know, that's not like any other developed countries. Even though we introduce a number of schemes like the SC side schemes, EOU schemes, etc., yeah. still it is not, we cannot really compare that with the free trade zone policies of the other developed countries. There are quite a number of actually tuning to be done. Now, we can expect that in the new foreign trade policy, which will be announced in the month of April. Now, one more thing area, it started working more collaborative way, all the facilitators working together rather than, I can know, in an isolated manner, I can know, it's okay, I can know, just doing it. That's, if you look into, since last, I can know, four to five years, it's working in a very good way. Everyone knows that. We alone cannot, I can, no, it is better to, I can, rather than creating a uh, single entity brand or something, it is better work together and achieve the goal more like a corporate. We have the objective, this is, this is what I can, no, we have to achieve. That is a good sign. Now, if you look into the digital era part of it, earlier getting any type of information, it was very difficult in India. Exactly. Now, if you look into the India trade portal, India trade portal is very, I can know, whosoever I can know, not seen or otherwise I can know, not browse to the India trade portal. Each and every person who is, I can know, into exporting mode business, they have to look into the India trade portal. All the information at one single point, I can know, you will get it. Now, most of the facilitators, they are not really, now say example, one, I quote you, quote, I can know, the Export Promotion Council. Export Promotion Council is not presently working only for promoting export. They are talking about foreign trade. Let the businessman or the, trade, the country, I call, no, the businessman decide what is, maybe if they want to I call, no, procure some of the raw material from um, abroad, let them they decide I call, no, where they can increase the profit margin and supply the best what's available across the globe. That is a very good area. That's why I call, no, the foreign trade policy, if you look into, now we are not talking about the incentives, et cetera, more like an exemption schemes, what we have it, like in the manufacturing, like the advanced license scheme, et cetera. The policies are so framed in such a way. Now, coming back to the World Trade Center, still I feel like, I don't know, in India, I don't know, we are not really taken full advantage of the World Trade Centers. Just to brief you, the World Trade Center, I know, World Trade Center is a brand name, it's a license, what you get it from the World Trade Centers, New York, uh, US always, I don't know very good in giving the license as part of it. Uh, and there are 320 plus World Trade Centers across the globe. Exactly. Each World Trade Centers are unique. What Bangalore World Trade was, I was with Mumbai World Trade Center. I cannot copy the Mumbai World Trade Center's business strategy for the World Trade Center Bangalore, which cannot be copied again to the Vishakapatnam. It's all different, like, looking into what the area and what really to be, you know, which uh, sector to be, what it was selected, where they need a hand-holding support, that we have to do it. But the global network is quite really too good. 
out of 320 World Trade Centers, nearly 30% of it is supported by the, or otherwise promoted by the government, like the Department of Industries and Commerce. It is not only an iconic structure, I always put it, iconic structure is the body, and the soul is the trade services, I cannot connecting that. And more connecting, maybe I cannot working together with the local association, or otherwise Chamber of Commerce, but more focus on the international trade and investment. This should be a platform just to exhibit the country's what you call capabilities across the globe. And it also I can now have a very good tie up with the in diplomatic mission. Maybe over a, no, today I can no, within no time I can fix up an appointment with the Canadian consulate. Because these are the neutral organization, not working for profit. Even though the World Trade Centers are promoted by some of the real estate company, but the objective of the World Trade Center is to promote international trade and investments. Coming back to the, uh, this one, uh, yes, India is doing well. Of course, still there is a long way to go. The policies, procedures, simplification, and ease of doing business is in the right track. Now, one area which used to have earlier undercutting part of it, that's also government made a lot of, I don't know, what you call control over that. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you a very uh, real example, I don't know. When government of Maharashtra appointed me as a nodal officer to promote the exports from the state of Maharashtra, I used to travel the rural area. I visited a place called Hupri, which is very close to Kolhapur. You don't believe the silver ornaments what they make it. It's really I can't know, it's too good. I can't know. The artist, the, how they I can't know, um, the design, the pattern, and all, which really the Europeans are not love it. I can't know, they buy it. Then the evening, I can't know, that program was organized by one of the state corporations, Maharashtra Small Scale Industries Development Corporation. At that time, it was very strong I can't know, to promoting this. I had a casual discussion with one of the iconoticians. I just asked him, what do you do, I can't know, where do you sell it? He told me I give it to, I sell it to the Asiatic. Asiatic is a department of stores at that time, very close to Chachigi Station of Mumbai. Oh. It's a big actual store. Then when he moved out, I can I asked his competitor. I can't know. He was just looking around, I can't know whether that person is there or not. I can't he doesn't want to, I can't know. This, this person also follow and go to Asiatic only. He will not go to Akbar Alice. <laughs> Got it? That type of things, I can undercutting, it is now, can say to some extent it's gone. That was one of the reasons, if you look into earlier, in the customs daily list, they used to publish where you are exporting. And the exporter's name, the country, they will, they will not give the importer's name, they give the country, of exp country where you are exporting and the exporter's name. Now, just to, what you call, prevent such type of unhealthy competition, now they remove that type of thing. That's why undercutting is not that much. I can know that's really a lot of improvement. Uh, but some of the area, like, now, day for a study in the newspaper, you might have read it, Vishagapatna, Michael, no, it is a city for I know, toys and the other, the yeah. railway station, they are exhibiting, I can know, all the items, what mean, I can know, manufactured in this state. That way, that's a good thing. Yes, still, I can know there is a, uh, more to do. And one good thing, now central government scheme also, I can know state government, whether it's an opposition to, still they also promote because it generate the employment. Sir, how about uh, the positioning of SMEs or MSMEs in terms of uh, uh, positioning themselves in the global supply chain. Of course, we proudly say, as I belong to Ministry of MSME, every time when we start talking about MSMEs, the goodness of MSMEs, we say they are playing a vital role in terms of employment, uh, contribute towards GDP, gross domestic product, uh, in terms of exports, 40 to 45 percent of uh, the total exports are coming from MSMEs. But still, I see the other side of the coin. Uh, the MSMEs could not could not go up to that particular level where they can position themselves and directly get into global supply chain. Uh, so, what could what you feel? Uh, how we, we can uh, 
help them in getting into uh, the global supply chain uh, so that uh, they make more money than what they are exactly making. Like you were talking about that silver on ornaments, especially like uh, you, yeah. you were uh, the advisor of Maharashtra government. So uh, can you give a brief about uh, how was it exported uh, later and what exact steps have been taken rather selling to a trader in uh, Mumbai or somewhere else? One of the Ekel, no, producer Ekel, one of the earlier speaker told like, you have to change according to the time. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you just have an opinion industrial estate, Ekel, no, which is the Asia's the largest industrial estate. Yeah. Now, my, what my grandfather's done, I mean, he have a, like anything if you do it, you should have a passion for it. What he has done it, the present generation is not ready to continue that. Okay? Exactly. But there are certain running costs. If you look into I don't know, the Spinia industries as a case study, if you take it, it's very interesting. I don't know. Maybe 70% of the industries are not working. Loss making. Yeah. Some of them they are giving that I don't know, area for a real estate. They are converting that into. You have to change the technology or whatever it may be, I don't know what Yash mentioned, I don't know. Look into the competitiveness of the other nations. We have to look into maybe a built up a consortium part of it or how you can reduce the cost. Exactly. How you mm. can engage. Why we are blaming, I don't know, China? Yeah. Because I happens to, I don't know, meet. Not, uh, I happens yeah. to meet, I don't know, the uh, Indian embassy, Shanghai. Shanghai. He is Mr. Rao. He's from Andhra Pradesh. He was just telling me, I don't know, boss, I don't know, you don't, blame them. There are so many things, good things to learn from them. Exactly. Always because every, they are, every... Because they are doing a mass production. That's why they are, I don't know, the per unit cost is less. Here the thing is, if one person is doing, they will not like look into create a big, maybe a laboratory itself, I know, since most of the government, I don't know, initiative the government uh, this is doing. If it's a private, they are not really doing that. Yes, you are right. We need to like, learn. No, yeah, we should not be fully dependent on government. Yes. Second thing, government should be a facilitator. They should not become come as a roadblock. They should create a good infrastructure facilities. Exactly. And should not interfere much into a girl. No, uh, like what it was happening earlier, like the Inspector Raja part of it. <laughs> License uh, Raj. Friendly visit. It is not a girl. To be yeah. cut Otherwise, a girl, no industry will cherish. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll come back to you definitely. A uh, lot of uh, information has to be extracted. Uh, now we have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Amanta K. Barwa, uh, very smart guy. I could see uh, neatly shaven. Uh, <laughs> you have to accept my compliments. Of thank course. you so much. Uh, yeah. So I would like to know your uh, specific inputs. Uh, you're a managing partner, and uh, I think it's a consulting organization, Pan IM. Uh, are you from IM? Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, very good. I am B or I am A? C. C. Not A, no B, it's C. OK. Uh, so how do you feel how we need to change our strategy in terms of capacity building, not just uh, building the capacity of human resources in other aspects also. We should also know how best uh, we should improve the export competitiveness right, uh, of our uh, country specifically. Right? And you should also give briefly about your own organization and how best uh, it is being applied. Uh, so uh, over to you. Sure. Thank you. So if you talk of global competitiveness, uh, you could leverage quite a few things to achieve competitiveness. You could exploit uh, the factors, yeah. you could exploit efficiency, or you could exploit innovation. And uh, India is putting a big focus on exploiting innovation. Exactly. Now, speaking from my uh, experience, and you know, I work very closely with startups. And if I were to draw a parallel between, uh, you know, what, MS, what MSMEs or what the textile sector does and what startups do, startups are way riskier to manage. However, if you look at the genesis story, right, of, of an entrepreneur, let's talk about the journey of an entrepreneur here. Now, a startup entrepreneur would start uh, by focusing on one problem that he wants to solve better than anybody else in the world does. 
every factor of production he will exploit, land, labor, capital, organization, would be directed yes. towards solving that problem better than anybody else. Yes. Right? And that is what makes him unique. We talk about, uh, you know, in the previous session also we talked about, uh, you know, we want India to be competitive and we are tying our success with volumes, right? Success is determined by value. If you look at most of the Swiss watch companies, they're all handmade, right? Yes. A, a Titan probably makes way more watches than Rolex, right? Yes. But I'm pretty sure a lot of, uh, lot more fake Rolexes sell than the original Rolexes, but you know, exactly, the Swiss industry right. still is making, you know, significant profits. If you look at a lot of the hypercars, right, you talk of the top-end Ferraris, you look at the Paganis, they yeah. are all uh, handmade. You look at the Bugattis, they're all handmade. So they are not mass players. There is an option to create value, value by, you know, by focusing on your craft and creating that premium. Now, that is something, you know, there are... Enormous, ex there are lots of examples present across the world, you know, where people have used, uh, you know, their competitive advantage as a success. In India, if you were to look at it, you know, the government is putting in a lot of effort in startups, right? There are incubators where you have startups come in, they are given all the factors required for success. They're given, you know, whatever they call capacity building, they're given connects to the market, they are yeah. given you know, connects to, you know, receive investments. Now, if it can work for a startup which is significantly more volatile than an industrial setup, I'm sure something similar could be brought about for, uh, you know, the MSME sector as well. As far as, you know, policies and procedures go, as so rightly mentioned, now it is very easy to get the policies and procedures. All you have to do is follow it. Yeah, more or less follow it, easier right? than what it was earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I believe we're in a good position now. It's just about looking at opportunities. There are, you know, hundreds of things that are going to go wrong in your journey. And forget about that. Look at the one or two things which are going right and move on. I mean, that is how I'd like to put it. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was a very uh, good answer and, uh, of course, very nice inputs you have put in. Uh, so we have a professor from Zimbabwe. Uh, of course, she is from textiles department. Uh, so we would like to know uh, how competitive uh, your textiles from Zimbabwe, as like we have seen right from the morning, the African texture, the African fabrics, they are very colorful. They are very beautiful actually, uh, colorful and wonderful. So we would like to know how competitive are, are your textiles in terms of uh, exporting them to other countries and how best you are going to do it. And any specific measures are being taken up to for the capacity building so that they are placed in the global market. Um, thank you very much. Um, Zimbabwe, we are doing quite well in terms of um, uh, producing the the, the textiles because uh, cotton, we grow cotton ourselves and we go on to process it, uh, spinning, and uh, we export most of the, the, the cotton uh, that we produce in the form of um, yarn to countries such as um, South Africa. Oh. So, uh, I think we are doing well in that area. But the challenge is now that cotton is now being grown um, at a smaller scale. We do not have um, areas, uh, large uh, space for growing cotton. Of course, the, the space is there, but the, the, the government support in terms of implements uh, is there, but you know, some of it is being diverted for one reason or the other if we look at the economical situation in Zimbabwe. So that is affecting us somehow because the, uh, uh, the amount of pro uh, cotton that we are producing has gone down. At the same time, we are exporting it um, at an earlier stage of production. Oh. If we were to, to go on and produce the fabric 
most the bulk of the fabric ourselves we are going to benefit more because some of these cotton when it's processed in South Africa we then buy it so that we produce uh, uh, garments so there is uh, a bit of challenge in that area but we are doing something, we are producing right up to, to textile. We produce our fabric ourselves, but as I have mentioned that the bulk of the, uh, uh, of the, the material uh, of the, in their raw state are being uh, exported and then we, we import, uh, uh, we, we buy them. To, to, to further process. So any specific measures are being taken up by Zimbabwean government? Uh, because you are saying uh, most of it is semi-finished and it is being exported and sometimes uh, finished product you are importing. Uh, uh, so any, any measures uh, at the university level in terms of research uh, is being taken up? Yeah, um, a lot of research is being done and um, we, we have come across a situation whereby in order for us to, uh, to reduce the amount of uh, yarn that is being exported, we need uh, technology, we need machinery exactly. equipment, exactly. which we do not have. What we have already is uh, in a uh, kind of uh, bad state that it cannot even produce what the, the uh, it is not in a capacity to produce what is supposed to produce okay so looking into that area uh, there is need um, for some kind of support some kind of funding so that we establish our own um, mills that can process uh, the bulk of the of the yarn right so the research is show that um, there is need, there is a gray area. There is need for us to establish some uh, industry, some factories, some mills that can see us through the, 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 uh, the textile production in the textile pro uh, production area. Because uh, you find that we import a lot of uh, fabric uh, from Asia, from, right? Malaysia, uh, uh, China, even India, I, I guess. You know, and this is the, the many-made uh, fabric, but we have got some raw materials that we can actually exploit and produce some of these uh, 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 e fabrics that we import. And uh, uh, obviously, we need to do it in an eco-friendly manner. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in terms of uh, trade, of uh, selling what we produce, I remember myself when I was doing uh, internship at a particular company, we, we used to produce for German, actually producing the garments, packaging them for export to German. But this has since vanished. Oh. Yeah, so these are some of the things that uh, are really affecting our our textile and clothing industry in Zimbabwe. It's because they are uh, political in the political environment, yeah. the economic environment. They, they they are also contributing to this. So you find uh, people get to 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 know about the we uh, like the textile dyeing and uh, the designing of the textiles. People. Um, they have taken advantage of the resort areas where tourists come, they go there, that's where they, they uh, display their artifacts for people from all over to, to, to see and buy. So th th that's one way that they found to be working for them, otherwise to, for them to be known, for their materials to be um, used in other uh, countries is kind of uh, is a, a bit of a challenge. Yeah, very nice inputs uh, you have put in. Uh, most of the developing countries face this problem, especially uh, with regard to the, uh, of course, the political, uh, socio-economic uh, situation. Uh, but I should tell uh, the audience and I should also tell the Ministry of MSME has a very beautiful scheme. 
that is scheme for uh, regenerating uh, the traditional industries where our age old thousands of years uh, age old traditional industries are there there will be a lot of artisans but they were working independently becoming competitive to each other so we have a concept of foody clusters wherein we bring all the artisans together we form an spv special purpose vehicle and 25% of uh, the contribution for this spv uh, it should be contributed by the members of the spv and 75% uh, grant will come from government of india and we will uh, create a cfc common facilitation center with all kind of machinery that is required latest machinery even you can import the machinery and where all the artisans will come they work in this uh, common facilitation center they they use their uh, of course in addition to their the, uh, their traditional artistic way they use the modern machinery and they try to like if you see the pochampalli in uh, telangana region that is being uh, it has got gi tag actually geographical indicator indication so like that i think this can be taken up uh, as an example in your own country for regen regeneration of uh, the traditional industries because it is our wealth all the third world countries have this wealth and it has to be exploited so the government needs to get into and the artisans should also join these kind of clusters so it it will definitely improve uh, not only help in the uh, domestic market but they can also get into international market that is what exactly happening all right uh, so very nice uh, talking to you uh, so any questions from uh, the audience uh, we would like to uh, have any questions from your side before closing so as the fag end of the day audience have received the inputs now uh, little tired some i feel so anyone anyone wanted to add anything else from the panelists in addition to what we have discussed so thank you very much uh, thank you shivan thank you uh, bosnair sir uh, thank you uh, 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 uh barua ji and uh, thank you masina uh, thank you for uh, your very uh, wonderful inputs uh, for uh, for the promotion of uh, the exports and uh, their uh, competitiveness especially among the textiles and uh, the smes to a very great extent it was a very eventful discussion we had thank you one and all i would like to now uh, welcome uh, and facilitate our esteemed panelist i would request sonia to honor our chairperson dr bos kenaya president wtc naya uh, now i would like to request sonia to welcome our esteemed panelist from mauritius mr seven siloi i would request sonia to now facilitate our another panelist from mauritius mr baglu now please kindly now please kindly facilitate our friend mr hamanta k borha managing partner pan im consulting organization last but not the least we would now would like to facilitate 
our dear friend, Dr. Masina from Zimbabwe. And please do facilitate. Uh, <laughs> we would like to have a group picture with all the ST panelists, please. Thank you. 